thought I'd start by asking uh, a leading question. How generous are you? I don't want to make this too personal. I was going to ask those who, when they see one of those people in, the, in, in Sheep Street in Bicester who are touting for a charity, do you cross over to the other side and walk round them? Um, we've had one or two people knocking on the door recently as well and uh, um, asking for money for charity. It's a good test of being generous. It's interesting that when uh, churches, some churches use plates to pass around for the offering. When they switched to using bags, the amount of money put in went down. Now, why do you think that might have been? Because nobody else could see how much was going in. Been to a church in Africa where uh, people went to the front to give and the amount that they'd given was shouted out to the rest of the church. Do you think that would encourage generosity? <laughs> when, I did my, uh, when I did my master's degree, I know it's hard for some of you to believe I'm intelligent, but I did do a master's degree, and I studied churches in Lambeth between 1851 and 1903. Yeah, I can see some of you are really excited at that thought. And what I discovered, one of the things I discovered was that several churches printed a yearbook, and in the yearbook they printed a list of what everybody had given to the church in that year. I wonder if you think that would encourage giving. And I'll finish this little introduction with one last story as you think about how generous you are, uh, and that is uh, the church in Africa I visited uh, once, very exuberant, lots of drums beating, the music was great, and so on, and they started... Uh, beating the drums, and I discovered that it was the offering. I had to ask because it was in the language I didn't understand. And people danced up to the front to make their offering. Yeah, Rebecca's up for that. We'll try that next week. Um, and they danced up to the front, and they put their money in the, uh, in the plate, and they danced back to their seat. And then uh, the person at the front said something else, and the drums started up again, and they danced up again. And they put more money in a plate. And I thought, well, you know, once is generous, but twice is, I mean, this is just asking far too much. So I asked the person who understood what was going on, what was going on? And they said, oh, the first time they went up, that was for their tithe. The second time was for their thank offering. And they understood that the tithe was a kind of what they had to do as their due for the life of the church. That was the starting point. And then if any of them felt they'd been blessed, not everybody went up the second time, but those who'd been blessed that week went up to the front again, still dancing, and made their offering. Well, we're in our series uh, called uh, The Vital Signs of a Healthy Church, and you can see that the title is Devoted to Giving. And we're taking the text from the words that uh, we've had read each day for the, the, this summer, uh, I was going to say this August. August is extended to the, last, the first Sunday in September this year. And here in the middle of the, this thing where we've, talked, where we've thought about how they prayed, we've thought about how they shared communion together, we've thought about how they listened to the, gave attention to the teaching of the apostles. In the midst of all that, these verses, two verses come, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Scholars have debated these verses extensively because these verses seem to suggest that the early church was so radical that many church leaders afterwards have just wondered a little bit about whether it was too radical. Here they were gathered together in Jerusalem and they were so committed to one another and so committed to the mission and ministry of that group that they were prepared to sell everything they had and to share it um, with those that were around them. Some people have argued that this was a special time for the church as they were gathered. Lots of those people in the church in Jerusalem were people who'd come. Do you remember there was a big gathering and uh, Peter preached and lots of people became Christians? And the possibility is that many of them stayed in Jerusalem to learn more about this new faith they'd found and therefore they had no means of support. So the believers that were in Jerusalem made a special effort to care for them because they were so concerned to see the church together and growing together. 
And some people are concerned that this was the beginnings of communism and they gave it up very rapidly. But I think what's interesting is what we can learn from these verses. I am not going to suggest today, even though I am the church treasurer, that you all go home and sell everything you've got and, uh, well, and give it to me as the church treasurer. I'm not going to suggest that uh, at all. But let's have a think about what these verses might uh, mean. A healthy church is a giving church. And these group of people made sure they supported each other within that fellowship. There was a commitment to one another that extended even as far as the wallet or the purse. Just making sure mine's still there. It is. It doesn't get open very often. You'll see the moths fly out when I open it. It's worth mentioning that we make sure in this fellowship we support each other. There have been times when people have a particular need, we're able to help them. We want to make sure that we don't just meet and say nice things to each other on a Sunday, but we take seriously the idea that we are a group of believers gathered together and we care for one another. And you will know, if you have a family, that there are times when caring for the family involves dipping into your pocket. Some of you are probably smiling inwardly, if not outwardly, at the last time one of your children asked for some money. We've had a debate in the family. We had our seven-year-old granddaughter staying with us this past week, and while she was with us, a tooth came out. Does the tooth fairy visit 27 Derwent Road? The answer is, not any longer. <laughs> we feel the negotiations with the tooth fairy are a matter for mum and dad. That's our theory. We don't think grandparents ought to interfere in that process at all. So I kept my hand on my wallet in my pocket. Then we discovered that there was a disagreement between mum and dad. So Stella knew perfectly well that she had to make sure that dad was the one in negotiation with the tooth fairy. Because that way she got a lot more than if mum was the one. Mum, of course, being our daughter, so has learned from us the extent of generosity... So hands up if you think 20p is enough from the tooth fairy. No. Hands up if you go for 50p from the tooth fairy. Oh, I want a little, little, little alert. There is no such thing as the tooth fairy. I mentioned that because the children are, well, are out. So don't get overexcited. I don't want people thinking I've been teaching heresy. So um, we got to 50p. How much people do you think a pound is suitable for the tooth a lot of you think a pound. It's simple, isn't it? It's, it might be the odd coin you've got these days. Who would go as far as a two-pound coin if that's all they had? Oh, oh, Matt, I'll be round to you when my teeth start falling out. Well, the rumour is that there are parts of London where there are certain children who might expect a five-pound note. I know. But then... It, same dad bought me a ticket for a test match. So he's a generous man, you know, so uh, we have to make allowances. They supported each other in the fellowship. They helped people outside the fellowship. I wanted to make this clear from the verses that we read. They gave to everyone who was in need. It doesn't suggest they made sure that those people were people that were coming to the gatherings each, week, each time. They gave to people in need. Part of what being a church group was, part of what being this group of Christians was, they wanted to care about people. And they cared about the people within the fellowship, but they also cared about people outside the fellowship. And that's an important lesson for us all as well. We are, I hope, people who care. We care enough to be able to dip into our pockets and give. The church itself has a rule that we give 10% to outside causes to support mission around the world. We try and make sure that we are generous with what is given to the church and make sure we think about other people outside the group that we're here together. And whatever you think about the idea of selling everything and giving it all away, we can definitely say they were generous. They thought that actually being able to support people in need was more important than holding on to the money for themselves. 
It's going to be quite a challenge thinking about this. I'm not under any illusion that all of you don't think about what's going to happen possibly next week, what might happen next year, what might happen in the years to come. I used to think about, I, I preached on this topic when I was younger. Now I'm a pensioner, I have a different view. Because I'm aware of the different situations we find ourselves in. But I can confidently say that they were generous and one of the vital signs of a healthy church is that its members and the church itself is generous. There's a choice given in the Old Testament as to whether you're going to be tight-fisted or open-handed. And God tells us to be open-handed. And one of the signs of people who are followers of Jesus is that they're people who are open-handed. I wanted to just give you some information. Some of you will know this all very well, uh, but it's just worth repeating it. Some of you may not know this. Orchard Baptist Church is financed by its members and regular attenders. We do not have hidden funds that we can draw on. The money that we have as a church to enable the church to function, to employ the staff that we have, to do the mission and ministry that we do, comes from its members and regular attenders. We have had some grants for special things. I don't want to uh, ignore that, but that's been relatively small. So as we were looking round earlier at communion at one another, you're looking round, you were looking round at the people who helped to keep this place functioning. There is no special fund outside. There's no sort of secret Baptist fund that uh, helps it. It's all funded by people, and it's funded by you and by me. So Orchard Baptist Church is financed by its members and regulars attenders. And I thought, being a church treasurer, I couldn't miss the opportunity to say, with the help of gift aid. And I was explaining to someone last week about gift aid, this wonderful method which uh, the government set up many years ago to encourage people to give to charity. And if you pay tax in this country and you gift aid the gift you make to the church, the church can get an extra 25% from the government. So if you're very good at maths, you know that 25% is quite big. And the amount we get in gift aid from the government because of people's giving is significant in the life of the church. So that always goes with the request, and that's why we always say, if you are a UK taxpayer, please consider signing the form. That's all you need to sign. Talk to Steve about it, and uh, he'll make sure you understand how to do that, and we can get that extra money back uh, from the government if you're a UK taxpayer. And I was trying to think how to phrase this next one, and I thought, oh, if I put it on the brink, that will make some of you sit up and wonder what I'm about to say. We're not on the brink of bankruptcy. That's not what I'm saying. We are at a significant time in the life of the church. You could argue every time significant. But we've been considering as a church how we will support the ministry that enables church services to take place, how we can support the, that ministry that takes place amongst us, and what we can do in mission in uh, Bicester. And we can only do these things and consider these plans if we know that we're going to have uh, the giving in place to enable it to happen. One of the reasons that we have the manse on Graven Hill and we were able to call Helen to come and work there was because some people, many people in the church, were very generous. Some were generous enough to make interest-free loans, which has saved the church thousands and thousands of pounds that we would have otherwise pays, paid in interest. So there's all sorts of ways in which we can give. And I want to emphasize now, in case I forget, in one sense, the generosity is what matters, not the amount. Some people can afford to give a lot more than others. What God asks you to do is not to think about what somebody else, the person seated next to you, might be able to give. I remember, I remember uh, uh, preaching at a church where the first person who'd been singing in the choir in that church came up to the door and shook my hand and said, thank you very much. And uh, they'd just been singing the intro about uh, the rich is sent away empty and bless the poor. Yeah, is that Mary? It's magnificent, isn't it? Uh, I'm looking at Paul because he knows these things. And uh, he shook my hand and said, thank you for the service. And then he went down and got into his chauffeur-driven Bentley and left the church. And I did think, it'd be very easy to sit there thinking, well, this is somebody who could uh, be very generous. But we can all be generous. 
And I want to tell this story now in case I forget. I've told it before, but it's worth telling again. I have a friend brought up in a children's home, um, left at the age of six. I tell this story, Susan will correct me when I get it, the bits of it wrong. But he left at the age of 16. He was given a suitcase with his clothes in, and it was a 10 bob note, and, and said, have a nice life, and left uh, and went and stood at a bus stop in Thornton Heath. And if any of you have been in Thornton Heath, you know standing at a bus stop there is an interesting experience in itself. And he got into conversation with a lady at the bus stop. And uh, I don't remember what sparked the conversation anyway. She asked if he was okay, I think. He asked her if he knew anywhere. That's right. See, Susan should have brought that. He said, I've got 10 bob to pay for it. Turned out the lady was from a church. And he stayed with her for years. That one conversation at the bus stop the first day he left. And that woman was a Christian who was generous and looked after him. And we got to know him uh, uh, when we were first going out together. And uh, I was best man at his wedding. And uh, he, he was a sign writer, a very skilled sign writer, one of these people who can produce those signs freehand with a paint. I never know how it, how it works, really. But his marriage broke up and his uh, company didn't do so well. And he got to a point where he was living not far from here and he was down. He was actually had no money in the bank at all. And he went into a big church in Oxford and was a bit taken aback when the sermon was about giving. And he partly sat there thinking, well, I've actually got nothing. I've just got a few coins in my pocket. And what made it worse was uh, it was a, a church with lots of students there and the person preaching started to say, well, I know some of you have not got very much because being a student, you don't have much money. And he gave a whole spiel about it. It wasn't about how much you kept. It was about how generous you were willing to be. Were you willing to put God first? And the preacher was directing that at students. And my friend, who was probably in his 30s then, didn't, knew it was directed at him. And when the offering plate came round, he reached into his pocket, took all the last coins he had and put them in the plate. The next day, he got a job. And within a year or two, he'd taken over the company. And if Les was here today, he would tell you that was because God was good to him because he was prepared to put God first. I'm getting emotional. It's an emotional story. He was generous with what he'd got. I put the picture out for the children to um, colour in, the story of the, the widow's might. Some of you know that. The two coins she had, very little coins. And Jesus commended her because she gave all that she had. And as far, when you read the background to the story, the likelihood is that there was a big treasury. We have a box here that people can put gifts in as they leave. But the treasury at the temple was probably a large box which had a horn at the top and if you put your coins in well it made a really good clattering noise as they went in. And the rich people would come along and made sure they tipped their bag out and the coin, you know those ones where the coins roll around, it was a bit like that and there'd be a lot of noise and everyone would know, a bit like dancing up to the front. So when she put her two coins in everybody would have heard she hadn't given very much but she'd actually given more because she'd given all that she had. We've been having a thought about uh, 10, 10, 10. One of the things we talk about is a tithe. There's no way you can really find in the Bible that says every Christian should give 10% of their income. There's verses in the Old Testament where it's clear that the farmers gave 10% of their crops, but it's not as even as simple as that. It's quite a complex story. But many Christians have used this as a guide as a starting point, like that church in Africa, that was the starting point. I had a friend who took seriously the idea that if he could afford to give a tithe and didn't have much money, he could afford to live on the same amount of money when he had more money. That's a graduated tithe. So he still lived on the same amount, but when he was earning, I think he was earning several uh, thousand pounds, I mean a lot more, um, we're talking a long time ago. But he gave all the extra away because he still only needed the same amount to live on. But the tithe is a starting point. And for some of you, it may be that's the starting point you want to make. Some of you may just want to find a little bit extra. It's not an easy time, is it? 
cost of living is difficult. We know that lots of people are using the food bank. We try and be generous in this church to support the food bank to help those who are in need. But one of the challenges for me, I'm a pensioner, I did the triple lock has been very good to me. Some of you don't know what that will mean because you don't worry about those things, but it means pensioners got a decent increase this year. I have to say that pensioners that rely on their state pension still don't have very much. It's worth saying. There's a sort of an illusion around among some of the newspapers that pensioners are all rich. Some are and some aren't, so we, let's make that very clear. But we all have resources that we can share. And the commitment that this church makes, and I can make again as the treasurer, is that we want to make sure we use the money that is given to this church to honour God and to support the mission of the church. And if, we want to, if you've been grateful for what you've received, Alison's been talking about what a wonderful group of people you are, this church existed because people like you have given and are giving to it. And if you'd like to see that continuing, then the challenge is, can you help to make it uh, continue? So the practical thing is, if you want to know more, talk to me about it. In the uh, email we send out, the MailChimp this morning, the details of, of all the forms you need, very simple way of giving. There's a QR code on there, which if you want to get the details of how you can make a gift, it's all there. But the key message this morning is that part of what happens when we become followers of Jesus is that our wallets and purses are supposed to be converted too. And we take seriously the command to be devoted to giving, just as those early Christians were. Because it's the way in which our prayers and the preaching and the worship are all sustained and become part of what God wants to do through this church. Those things are vitally important, don't misunderstand me. It's not that one thing's more important than the other, but together, as we've seen from these verses in the book of Acts, they listened to the teaching. They devoted themselves to doing what God wanted them to do. They prayed. They wanted to be in line with what God wanted them to do. They shared communion together as a sign of their fellowship. And in the midst of all of that, they were devoted to giving. They were generous with what God had given to them. One of the things you learn about being open-handed is that when God gives to us, our hands have to be open. Some of us are quite good at then closing our hands around what God gives to us. But God gives to us so that we can share with others. We meet our needs, of course we do. We're concerned about our family, but we embrace our church family. So the church family can continue to be the kind of place and the kind of people God wants them to be. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gift you gave us in Jesus, and you still give to us by your Spirit. We ask for your help to be as generous ourselves as you've been to us. As we receive from you day by day and week by week, help us to be people who share, who share all the resources that you've given to us as we pray for people, as we worship together. Help us to be willing to give, to sustain the mission and ministry of the church. Bless each one. Bless those who are struggling financially at the moment. Take away any sense of guilt that they can't do more. And bless those who are able to give and do give and encourage them. And help us all to be able to see that money is used wisely and well. For the sake of your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.